Well, hello. Welcome to Spindle City Straight Talk. I'm Chip. And I'm CJ. And I'm CJ. And it is Wednesday in the Rift after a a raucous and rowdy city council meeting. <laughs> yes, I got a little uh, I got a little rowdy, and I I do not apologize. I was hoping to be taken out of there in handcuffs because that was the biggest disgrace I have ever seen. It showed how why this city is going down the toilet that you know what was interesting what was interesting last night was it seemed that certain city councilors like Laura sampson were prepped because the questions that were asked were specific very specific questions and those same questions were asked by councillor brad kilby now well the interesting thing was that they voted 4-4 initially, which creates a deadlock, which means the motion fails. But Cliff Ponty made a motion for uh, reconsideration. Now, from my remembrance of parliamentary procedure, the motion for reconsideration must come from the prevailing side. Nobody prevailed. The motion was out of order. Correct. But then again, listen, CJ, parliamentary procedure, the law, they don't care. Oh, they were very well prepped. Yes, listen, they were. Paul, Paul's been on the radio could, talking about the statute, the statute, the statute. And that's what they focused on. And look, I mean, I know the game. I know the game. They're using, they're using lawfare. And, but what they did was um, they restricted the debate. They, that's why I had to yell to get up there. And they didn't want us to make a presentation about the fact that what Perak testified to at that meeting, that the retirement board failed in their fiduciary responsibility. They voted no just to get there. And they did say they were open to litigation. But you see, the council knew that if we got into that area, we could tell the people that they fought, they fired a fifth member who'd been on the board for 26 years, that they voted for for 26 years because he wouldn't give them the money they wanted. And then that they, they, we could have read the resume of the individual who they didn't even interview, even though we offered them the opportunity. See, they didn't not, I got that in when I was, you know, when I went up there and because they were talking about me, they did not want us to speak. They wanted to keep that only on that one piece and we don't refute that. The fact is that the mayor does have the right to make the appointment when it gets to that point, but the, but the reality is it shouldn't have got to that point. That memo clearly prohibits that and, and they said that the board acted, well, not the two elected members, but the board acted improperly. So that should have never got there. But this is the flaw in the law. And they were well prepped. And they used every means they got. Brad Kilby made sure, got right into the record, and all he did was reiterate the law. Uh, the, the board council. I want to know who asked the board council to write a letter. The board's going to pay. But I know that Jimmy and I didn't authorize that. I want to know who told the board's lawyer to take an action that the board didn't approve. I can take a pretty damn good guess who did it. But this thing was rotten from the core, stunk to the high heavens from the beginning. But this is why the city's going into the toilet. I mean, what they did last night was a railroad job. And I know that threats were made to various unions not to support this. After the contract we gave you, you're gonna, you, you, I can't believe you're gonna support this. There are rumors that the individual who was so, one of those individuals has already promised a job. So he can boost his pension. 
A lot of rotten things going on in this city. A lot of rotten things going on. They got a stranglehold on this city. And the council, Cliff Ponty, he sold out without a doubt. The, the board didn't do their job. No. The, the elected members of the board did do their job. The two city non-elected members of the board intentionally acted in direct conflict with their fiduciary responsibility to allow the mayor to handpick someone. And that characterization was intentional to cloud the issue. So let me make this clear. You know, we are gonna we are gonna litigate this. We're gonna have to scrape up the money. People are gonna have to give us money, but we gotta fight this. But this city's in deep deep trouble. We have a we have a city that's locked down by the power players and the Coogan puppeteers. Not only us, just look at what happened to the Flint Neighborhood Association. Totally disrespected again, totally ignored again. And who was the picture? I had the picture in here. And who's there in the picture? Paulie Pockets, the hero of the Flint, the savior of the Flint. Sure he is. Now, how much affordable housing has been built up there? How about the people who can't make it? But who's in there? Paul Coogan, who was laughing last night before the meeting. Ha, 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 ha. I told you this was it, it's this is a done deal. We get anything we want, legal or illegally, we don't care, but we'll, we're going to pretend we abided by the law, but not all of the law. But Carlos Caesar, as the president of the Flint Neighborhood Association, or the Flint Neighborhood Association, to my knowledge, never received an invitation to that dog and pony show. But who was there? Carol Fiola. Orky, Jakey Orky Corsi, and Paul Schmidt. All the people that don't give two shits about the Flint. But it's a great photo op. Paul wants to say what a great guy he is. He's going to save the Flint, like they said in 87, right before he tries to get a two and a half override. I mean, this whole thing was ridiculous. The whole meeting was ridiculous. I mean, I hope people watch it. Before the regular meeting started, they had a company down there telling you that even though you go buy everything you can to save water, special shower heads, special faucets, special everything, you're going to pay more. Especially if you save water. You're going to pay more even though you use less. And you have to get absolutely have to get an increase in your water rates every single year. You know why? You know where those people are from? And you watch the harp seals except for Michelle going, uh, 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 uh. Oh, that's great. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. More money, more money, more money. Screw the freaking taxpayer. Screw the people. More money, more money, more money. You know where they're from? They're from the cabal. Remember a few years ago that people were talking about buying all the water supplies in the world. And rather than making water a natural resource, they're going to make it a, a, a commodity. What they presented last night in front of the city council was a plan to take a natural resource, water, that the city provides to, this, to, the, to its citizens and should give that water at a reasonable rate because water is a necessity and turn it into a business a revenue stream what they were saying at that meeting last night was we're making water a revenue stream we're going to charge people you might as well go to the store and buy your water because they're telling you now we're here to make a profit. We're going to increase your rates 
And no matter how little water you use, we're going to make sure we keep increasing the bill so we have a steady revenue stream. That is appalling. People, last night was the greatest example I have ever seen of how government has completely taken over. And remember what Thomas Jefferson said, and I'm paraphrasing because you know I love quotes. When a government becomes powerful enough to give you everything you need, it has the power to take everything you have. And that's exactly what this administration and this council has done. And in the minutes of the retirement board meeting that I have, they said they can't afford anything they've done. The contracts, Diamond, Durfee, and I'll read it to you later. But what they did last night by doing that, and you're right, CJ, they, they, it was orchestrated, they were prepped. They violated their fiduciary responsibility because they kept saying, uh-oh, well, only talk about the fact that the mayor's got the power. But that's not true. How did he get the power? Just in case you think, you know, this is my thing. You see what that says? Cornell Law School. Cornell. It's one of the Ivy League schools. The duty of care. The duty of care requires that directors, that that's the city council in this case, or the retirement board or anybody, inform themselves, quote, prior to making a decision of all material information available to them. And this isn't an opinion, this is a court case. Smith versus Van Gorkum. And then it goes on to say, whether the directors were informed of all, ma all material depends on the quality of the information and the advice available. Whether directors had, quote, sufficient opportunity to acquire knowledge concerning the problem before the action. They did not avail themselves of the sufficient opportunity. And that's from Moran versus Household Intern, Inc. Moreover, another one, a director may simply not accept the information presented. Rather, the director must assess the information with a, quote, critical eye, unquote, so as to protect the interests of the stockholders, who in this case were the city taxpayers and the retirement board. And that's back to Smith versus Van Gorkum. And I'll close with a quote. You know why they didn't want us to talk? I had all this shit there. And they knew it. They didn't want the people to know. That's why we do this show, so the people can know. And I'm going to, I'm going to clo close it with an Obama quote, even though he wasn't one of my favorite presidents. When the public loses trust in government, this isn't a quote, this is part of their duty to maintain public trust in government section from the Cornell Law School. When the public loses trust in government, public corporations suffer, compliance with laws fail, consumers lose their confidence. And to quote President Obama, quote, if the people cannot trust their government to do the job for which it exists, to protect them and promote their common welfare, all else is lost. That was a disgrace last night, but it was a show of why you've got to get to the polls. We've got to go back to 1995 when they threw five of them out of that council for not listening to the people. And we've got to throw eight of them out. They knew I had a thick packet and I presented it to the clerk. But they knew everything I had because they know me. And I gave this stuff to them a million times. They just ignore everything. They don't do their job. The city council should be sued by 10 taxpayers, especially if they approve a two and a half override. This, is, this was a disgrace. I'm fuming. I very rarely disrupt a meeting because I do believe in decorum. But when 
You know, they have gone beyond pissing on your leg and trying to convince you it's raining. They are now shitting on your head and trying to tell you it's a mudslide. And with that, CJ, I'll turn it back to you. CJ is here. CJ. Oh, there you are. You're back. As I said, I had a suspicion last night, and I spoke to you about it, and I told you about it, that they weren't going to allow you to speak because they didn't put it on the agenda. Had it been put on the agenda, they wouldn't have been able to shut you up. And I spoke to Michelle Dion, who said she spoke to the secretary for the city council, who said the information and the invitations were included in the packet. If you have both the retirement board and the city council meet with quorums, then you have to have a joint meeting and you have to post that, which the city council knew that as you heard Joe Kamara say last night. And he knew and he did not post or have posted a joint meeting, which he should have done. So again, another person abdicating their responsibility because Joe doesn't make the agenda. The city clerk does under orders from the mayor. Joe may alter it a little bit, but Joe doesn't create it. I have been told this by several previous presidents of the city council. And they say that the mayor generates the agenda. Which means that the mayor has the city clerk put into the agenda to accept and expend, giving him the authority to spend the money. To accept and expend. That is not the job of the mayor. That is the job of the city council. But for some reason, this city council, people like Laura Sampson, can't get it through their thick freaking head that their job is to manage the funds. It is their job. Your job is not to ask, well, how are the kids doing with the basketball? How are the kids doing with the boxing? That's not your job. That is not your job. And for the eight city councilors to sit there and violate parliamentary procedure, which they do regularly, parliamentary procedure is only good when it benefits them. It's just like the law. It's only good when it benefits them. And then Cliff Ponty had the audacity to say, well, you know, we got stuck in this position a few years ago when the mayor sent down the budget and we didn't act on it in 45 days. Okay. That's your fault. That's your fault. And that's the problem. And, and you know what? You're right, Steve. Cliff did say you'll, they'll probably never re-elect re -elect us after this vote. You know what? You're probably right. The presentation that Nelson did last night, true, about how the process is supposed to go about for Prop 2.5, even more interesting as well. And the thing is, is they shut him down before he even started. They wouldn't let him go on. They wouldn't let him go on. And why do they keep getting elected? They keep getting elected because the voters are stupid. They're apathetic. They don't care. They feel their vote doesn't matter. And this is what creates the problem, the apathy that we have in this city. We have to elect people that are exactly leaders, Scott. They have to be leaders. And we don't have leaders. We have people who are complacent in their positions because they've held them for so long. We had that problem with Leo Pelletier. We have it with Linda Pereira. We're now getting it with Sean Kadeem. Sean Kadeem says one thing and votes the other way. So these are the people you will let. Joe Camara, his pastor at his church, in violation of IRS code, said before the election, I want you to give your vote to Joe Camara because he's a good guy. 
You don't elect somebody because he's a good guy. You elect somebody because he represents you, the people. Because he does what's right for the, for the people and the city. And we don't have that. We don't have that. Hey, and listen, uh, they don't they don't abide by any laws. Um, the the fact is that they they just trample all over everybody without a regard, and they lie. Okay, here here are the minutes of the November 29th meeting, just to show you. And I showed this to a police officer who was there last night. And I said, you see how they lie? This is, th I'm going to read this basically we just, th when we discuss the thing. At this point, the chairman asked for discussion. Ms. Alman, who is the CFO, noted that the board, that to the board, that the financial position of the city and the dilemma it was facing given the recent contractual increases it has absorbed with various unions throughout the city as well as funding for both the new high schools constructed in the city being Durfee and Diamond. She stated the city has been asking for concessions from all departments due to the city's financial position. So there you go. Ms. Almond, again, they were informed when they, they, when they negotiated all these contracts and funded them. I sent them a letter all the time reminding them that Chapter 150E, Section 7, clearly states that all contracts have to be funded. All the money necessary to deal with everything in that contract has to be appropriated by the City Council. It wasn't. And I'll tell you, the fact is, you're right, they didn't interview people for that position, but again, again, they didn't want that to be, to, you know, to be even discussed. But the city's finances, she is admitting what we told you right after that meeting when she said, when she was questioned by Michelle Dion, and said, how are you going to, how are you going to fund this at the end of the contract when all the big pay raises really hit? Oh, we're looking at some investments down the road. That's not a revenue stream. Some investments, what's the investment portfolio? What's the return on these, anticipated return on these things? How stable are these investments? No! And then the city council went one further. At the budget last year, they didn't even discuss revenue streams. Oh, who gives a shit? We don't care. We don't care if we don't have the money. We're going to ask for concessions. They haven't asked for a concession from anybody except the retirement board who now they're going to have the votes to steal the money and not do their job to be a fiduciary for the members and everything. This, she said it. And every one of those things was not new. They negotiated those contracts. They knew Diamond was coming. They knew Durfee was coming. As a matter of fact, CJ and I were, were arguing with Coogan about the debt override through the whole process before they even got the Durfee override. So you're going to tell me these are unanticipated expenses? No. This is, this is fiscal irresponsibility. Violation of their fiduciary duty to the taxpayer. That's what it is. And then... Mr. Nassif said, reiterated the concerns of Ms. Allman, as well as noting these are assumptions that could change based on market. It was stated that uh, that uh, needs to be realistic about the city's financial position. No, no. We don't have to be realistic. We are realistic. But we have to be realistic about the, the retirement system's financial position. And they weren't. They violated their fiduciaries that by their own words they are, con they are convicted. They were, they were advocating because the city's broke because they didn't do their job. We're broke because the city did exactly this to the retirement board from 02 to 12. They had the three votes then 
and they made us the third worst in the state. We did our fiduciary. Mr. Machado in this said that he, he was concerned about the city's future concerns and we would have to deal with that. And I went on to say, Mr. Kamara said he believed it was important to go with alternative one because although the progress has been made since the last valuation, the fund ratio was still barely 50% and felt it was the board's responsibility, which by the way it is, because it says it in the law, that we are fiduciaries for the members in there, not the city. Yeah, I already lost my thing. Because it made progress, he felt the board's responsibility to ensure the system was funded for the benefit of the retirees. He said he did not disagree about the city's ability to pay to make future payments, but that should be addressed at a future time and we should not keep kicking the can down the road because that is why the system is in the predicament it is now. So Mr. Machado and I are fully aware that this, but it's the city's fault again. So their method, they care so much about the retirement system and the taxpayers that their plan to fix the retirement system is to put it deeper in debt and have the taxpayer, they can't afford the payments they're going to have now at the end of this funding schedule and they want to increase that n number. You know why? Because they won't be in office. And most of them will not be in our retirement system. Paul Coogan is not in our retirement system. Half of these other people might be in a retirement system. Yeah, that's that's public that's public record. You can well, we can ask. We've got the minutes for the last three meetings. But it's all the last three meetings there was nothing. That's when that last the last two meetings is when they fired the guy that had been on 26 years for no reason without a comment and that's going to be in court and the next meeting is when they they refuse to interview the most qualified candidate that's ever applied for a job in fall river so i mean all that stuff's going to come out when we go to court and litigate it because this is not it's no longer it was never about the mayor's ability to appoint somebody when it gets to that point, but the point is it shouldn't have got to that point because Perak made it very clear. But again, politicians make laws with loopholes that'll help them. You think it's not, you think it's a coincidence that politicians can purge themselves? Look at, look at the January 6th committee now. They're finding out they suppressed information about the fact that Trump never jumped over the, the steering wheel. The driver said that, and it's an impossibility because they have bulletproof glass separating the president or something. But they had testimonies. Like they didn't call for the they, they didn't call for the National Guard two days before. All of that, and these are con these are congressmen knowingly suppressing the truth. If you did that or I did that we'd be in jail. We'd be doing time. If you were unfortunate enough to walk around the lobby of, 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 the, of Congress uh, with, a, with a set of horns on, you'll be, doing, you'll be doing four or five years in jail. But these people perjure themselves, steal money from the government, steal money from the taxpayers, get all the little pet projects like uh, uh, let's put uh, ankle bracelets on hop seals or something like that because your friend owns some company that does it. They get away with this. And you know something? Maybe on a federal level we can't do a damn thing. But last night was a call to arms. Last night showed you if you want to change this city, we have 55,000 registered voters. 14,000 people control this city and I think 12,200 of them got jobs from Paul. <laughs> you can't change it unless you go to the polls. And we have to get some new blood 
and we have to make that new blood go out there and work it work on a campaign trail we have to get the people out there because listen we have a we have a tyrannical fascist city you can't get anything done. You go before that council, they'll ignore Nelson, they'll ignore Colin Dyer, they'll ignore me, they'll ignore you. That you will send them letters. They don't even they wipe their ass with it. Send them the law, we don't care. I mean, look at Cliff Ponty. Cavalier. Oh, who cares? Threatening litigation. We're always subject to litigation. That's right, Cliff. And you don't pay for it. The city will pay. You don't care. You just proved that you sold out. You sold out. You were one of the counselors who I reached out to and told them, told you to come here and look at some of this information. Talk to me. I never got a call back, did I? You were too busy moving your office. Screw the people of Fall River. Screw the taxpayers are going to have to pay for the retirement. Screw the retirees. Who cares? I'm making money. And that's it, CJ. And if you think I'm frustrated, now I got to go to a meeting and sit with those people. And mysteriously, for the first time in history, the retirement board's not meeting at 8 30 in the morning. We're meeting at noon. Oh, why? Oh, that'll give them time to swear in their appointee. And he can go to the meeting. And I can tell you, there are no, there's going to be no confusion about where the battle lines are drawn any longer. And these people have no idea how it's going to bite them in the ass. You know, my question is, who set the time? Doesn't the board set their own, doesn't the chairman, and you're the acting chairman, no, well, the director, that's another thing about last night you said, CJ, they covered their ass by saying they were, they called the retirement board up, and but they invited Mike Pasternak. And he yes, I noticed. Up, when he walked up there, you said, well, I guess that's me. Well, it wasn't. Mike Pasternak is an employee of the board. Right. He is the director. We hired him. The board is the four members of the board, and two of them were city people. And so realistically, the only people that constitute the board that are not appointed or hired are the two elected members. That's Jim Machado and I. So if they called the board up, they could have called one from the city side, one from the, one from the elected side, but they did not call the board. The board was not was not represented. And when I got up and tried to do it, and Jimmy was fully prepared to make a presentation too, they knew the last thing they ever wanted is to to abide by their duty to give us a fair shake. So, I, I I understand that, but my question still remains: Who changed the time of the meeting? Well, because well, and here's my here's my reason my rationale behind this. Okay, when was the meeting posted, and for what time? Because if it was posted for eight thirty, they can't change it to noon. They have to find well, no, a new posting. CJ, no, that's the problem. For the first time, um, in I don't know recorded history, it's always at eight thirty. It's normally posted. But mysteriously, but we know there were phone calls made. We know Paul Coogan called the retirement board lawyer, which he's not supposed to do. We right. know there were, we're going to ask for any kind of emails and stuff. We go to court. We're going to ask for public records disclosures and stuff like that. And and and, uh, but for the first time in history, Mike Mike Pasternak was out of state, and supposedly. Somebody at the board forgot to get it in on time, so they couldn't have it at 8.30. So then we got a call saying, oh, you know, uh, we messed it up and we can't have it. And by the t we, we can't post it until like 10 o'clock for the meeting. But then uh, uh, some of these people uh, have, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, have something to do at 10, can we make it at noon? So we're going to go at noon, but I know that. Listen, if look, you know, like I said, you can crap on my head and try to tell me it's a mudslide. You can pee on my leg and try to tell me it's raining, but I've been around too long. I know damn well why they did this, because they got to swear, they got to swear in there at their point D. And City Hall isn't open at 8.30. They would have had to swear him in last night. Or make a special consideration. But now he can just wander down to City Hall, put up his right hand, and show up at the meeting. That's why this was done. It's a coincidence. A coincidence that the first time in recorded history, they didn't get this thing on time. And that's their reason. And you know something? You can't prove it. It's just speculation. Right. But as it says in the law, you have to, when you're exercising your fiduciary responsibility, which those two people didn't, you would have to act the way a prudent and reasonable individual with the knowledge of the way things are done would have done, which means set the retirement board ahead. This, this whole thing was a massive, massive uh, conspiracy to get their way like he did with the with the budget, like he did with the opera money, like he does all the time. The Coogans, like he did with the Armory. And the bottom line is, they've got the, they've got the votes now. They, got, they own the council. They own the sixth floor. And the only way... They own the school committee. The, they own the school committee. We do, not, we do not have a chance until the next election because these people... As I said, Cliff Park said it, we're probably not going to get elected. And you know something, Cliff? You shouldn't. And with that, I'll turn it back to you. Well, I'll tell you, this was last night's meeting was an absolute total shit show. An absolute total shit show. And that's a shame. You should have been given the time necessary. Joe Kamara should have made sure that Perak and you were on the agenda. He refused to do that. The, the retirement board should have posted a, a joint meeting with the city council. That didn't happen. So it was the ball was dropped or conspiracy. Here we go. There was a conspiracy to withhold the information from the city council and the people. Because the city councilors that spoke vehemently on these issues, except for Michelle Dion, were well prepped. They were well prepped only on one thing. The legal issue. They were focusing on was the mayor authorized under the law? And Laura Sampson said it. We did this. Did we do this legally? That's all our concern is. Is this legal? And under the letter of the law, yes, it's legal. But Parak made it clear before that came, before, the, before that portion came before the city council, that they are given broad authority under the law, to issue memorandums. And those memorandums become the rules, the regulations. The city council failed to recognize that. They failed to recognize that. And I'm sorry to say it, when I heard Michael Sacco's um, email to the city council, and I agree, who authorized it? The board didn't authorize it because you didn't meet to authorize it. Did Pat Mike Pasternak authorize it? I don't think so. But you're going to pay for it. You're right. You are going to pay for it. But that letter was strictly the legal position of the law. It was the exact exactly that. The legal position of the law. And Brad Kilby knew that that was requested, which means that he either spoke with the city clerk or spoke with the mayor about getting it or was being told that it had been acquired. And that's why we have the problems we have. We have a mayor who violates the open meeting law on a regular basis by meeting with city councilors, being sure that he can assess his votes and change the votes that are necessary. And that is a violation of the open meeting law. Doesn't matter if you meet him once, or only one, or only two, or only three on the same day. It goes by how many you met or in its entirety about the subject. The problem is you can't file the complaint against the mayor. 
It has to be filed against the city council. And those city councilors are kissing the mayor's ass. They're giving him a damn rim job. Okay? CJ, let me just inject this. It, it was obviously, like you said, they were, they were prepared. Focus on that one little piece of the law. Not Perak clearly stated that the those that the board violated the Perak memo and regulations that you have to interview. I I had to go up and give them the 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 crab case. I read off the crab case, even though I didn't want to hear it because I had it. That said that that made that they you know so. But again, the flawed law. We have to now sue the retirement board because they didn't do it. And you know what they else, you know the other big thing they glossed over, you notice this, if, you, if people paid attention, when Perak affirmed that this city pays late yes. and doesn't pay, and, and we lose $600,000 in interest, and we have to, so it cost us not the half a million now they're going to rob, I mean, they have 500000 yeah, half a million dollars that they're going to try to get. But the 600000 we lost in interest. And you know, we're never going to get that interest because you know why? We have to go and tell Perak to collect it. And you think they're going to get the three votes to say that? No. They're going to keep stiffing the public, letting you pay more for this for, for the retirement, the city's portion, you're paying the bill for them. It's the city tax money anyway, and they don't care if that bill goes up. Like Cliff Ponty said, oh, so what? They're going to litigate. Big deal. Does that cut my salary here for my being a city councilor? Does that affect my real estate business? Yeah, no, to hell with these nitwits. We don't care. $600,000 in it. The city pays by the month. And I said at that meeting, and a, I, that's how I got the, the fifth member to vote. I said, you're a banker, Martha. Do you, the bankers normally give better interest rates to people who never pay on time? And his answer to that was no. And then he voted the, the right way to say, you know, we've got we've to protect the system that's already in trouble, the retirement system, because that's who we are fiduciaries for in this room. And so they fired him for it. So that's the problem. They the, no no city councilor jumped up and said, "Wait a minute! Why is the city paying by the month? What the hell is this? There's a requirement to pay, and they ignore that. They get to ignore everything they want and anything they want. You do that, that's it. You're getting fined. You throw the wrong bag in when they got the purple bag, you're getting fined." They pick up all their friends' trash in violation of an ordinance for years and years and years. Nothing happens. So, you know, like I said, last night, look, I knew we weren't going to prevail. Chip, you're muted. You know, you I go. knew it was going to go through last night because they got enough people in the tank. But just like they did in the retirement board, they were too dumb even to just say, okay, we'll interview them and then say we, we don't like them. That's right. That's all they had to do. And even though you would have known that it was politically motivated because this guy was eminently qualified, but then they would have satisfied the damn, <laughs> you know, the damn process. And we couldn't have even gone there and complained. That's so right. We went to court. That's right. And but just see, like Paul was too stupid. Paul yeah. was too stupid to realize that. Yeah. Paul and was too stupid to realize it. Bridget was too stupid to realize it. Mock Nathan was too stupid to realize it. They didn't realize all they had to do was have the phone interview. And then they could say, we don't want him. And nothing could have happened. This would be a mute, a mute issue. There would be no way to go. Because they did what they were supposed to do. And last night, they could have allowed Jim and I to go up, say what we had to say, show the evidence that we had, and then they could have ignored it. But now they're accessories to a cover-up. They don't want the people to know the truth. 
they're going to look at, tell you, no, no, you know, you all heard that old saying, you can't see the forest for the tree, you stare at the tree. Yep. Well, the city council was told to look at the leaf. Don't even look at the tree. Just look at the leaf. Forget about the forest. Look at the, not, forget about even the tree. You just focus on this and we'll ignore them. We'll pretend they don't exist. And you know something? For them, we are invisible. And until we take back our government, until we take back the government on every level, it's going to stay this way. And some of us will continue to fight, but, you know, uh, to fight for what you believe in is far better than to be one of the herd. And that's what they are. Too afraid to go out and do what they got to do. We got, we got over 40,000 people who didn't vote. Damn it. All we need is another 10,000 to go out to the polls and we can change the world. All right, CJ, back to you. Well, we've been beating this dead horse, and I'll tell you now, uh, you know, fighting sometimes, you just, they, they wear you down. And that's the entire position of the city, wear them down. But I will tell you one thing. I'm the only one that has won over the city council because I filed an open meeting law complaint. They were fined $1,000. They spent fifty dollars to $100,000 trying to argue that they didn't have to pay for a thousand dollar fine and that to them was what money well spent spent so for a thousand dollars they spent fifty to a hundred thousand dollars and they lost they had to pay it anyhow that was under joe macy so again this is what the city thinks about your tax dollars so remember that and with that i want to thank you all for watching and remember stay safe Stay angry and please hold your politicians accountable. Have a great day and we'll see you on Good Friday.